back to school. Welcome to the end of summer, my friends. So if you don't know me, my name is John Fish and I am a Harvard student. I'm taking a year off right now, but I just wrapped up my second year studying computer science. And truthfully, the only way that I have gotten to the point where I am as a student is through sheer luck. I've had really good mentors, really good role models, teachers, who have taught me how to succeed in the school system because it's something that can be taught. So my goal today is to share with you some of the biggest lessons that I've taken away from these people, lessons that I've applied to my own career as a student and that I've noticed other successful students applying, so that hopefully if you haven't been as lucky because sometimes the school system just sucks, uh, that maybe you can take something away from this video. Now, before I get into things, I don't have a sponsor on this video, but I do have a back to school sale going on right now on my growth books, which are daily planners that I've designed and I sell on Amazon. And they've now helped thousands of students and just people to organize their lives and to live more productively and to have better time management skills. I'll talk more about how I use it later in the video, but there's a link in the description if you're interested. So I want to start off by saying that I think there's a general conception that students are born the way that they are. They're either good students or they're bad students, depending on essentially their IQ. But this is just not true. Being a good student is something that you can learn. While everyone does have a different baseline intelligence, there's no denying that, the, the fact of the matter is that work and habits are far more important when it comes to success, both in school and in life than your baseline intelligence. So if you can learn how to work and if you can establish effective habits, then you will be a far more successful student regardless of your baseline intelligence. So with that in mind, what I've done is I've basically created a list of the habits that I think effective students follow from my own experience, from the experience of my mentors and from my observations of other successful students. And I've distilled them into a simple list. And then throughout the rest of this video, I'm gonna be breaking down each of those elements so that you can kind of bounce around if you wanna to refer to this again in the future, or if you just wanna watch through, I've organized them in kind of a chronological order. So here's the list. One, go to and engage in every class. Two, in class, take physical notes by hand and keep those notes organized. Three, ask questions during and after class to understand things that you don't understand, not to prove that you're listening. Four, do your homework, but do it right. Understand that the point is to learn, not to do menial work. Five, find a time management system that works for you. Get it down early so that you already have it in place when you need it. Six, learn how to study effectively for tests and practice this skill. And finally, the most important habit, but the one that the most people neglect is take care of yourself because this one if you don't do it the rest of them don't really matter and i'll explain that at the end of the video so the first habit is like the most basic possible one it's literally just show up and sit near the front of the class turn your phone off eliminate all distractions and by eliminating all these distractions you are forcing yourself to focus, essentially. One of the fundamental things that successful students do is they understand the material the first time it comes around. So then later, they don't have to relearn the material and relearn it and relearn it. If you can build understanding when the material is taught, your life will be tremendously easier when the material is being tested. So show up to every class you can, eliminate all distractions, and focus. It is the easiest thing, but also kind of hard to do in practice. But once you build a habit out of it, once you do this, you know, in most of your classes, it just becomes default. And you're not missing out on anything. Now, I've done videos on how I take notes in the past, but I think it's valuable to just kind of break down uh, in, you know, a nutshell. So it's really a three-step process. The first step is to write your notes physically on a piece of paper, not on a laptop, even if your teacher allows it. This is just, again, eliminating distractions and there are studies which have shown that taking physical notes will help you recall information better. From anecdotal experience, I can confirm this. Now, secondly, this is where a lot of people mess up. Don't write down what the teacher is saying verbatim and don't copy the slides verbatim. What you're trying to do here is you're trying to understand the material as it gets taught and then summarize and paraphrase it in your notes. This is critical because in order to paraphrase, you need to understand. You can't paraphrase things that you don't understand. It just like doesn't make sense. What you're doing is listening to the material, understanding it, paraphrasing it on your notes, and then the notes are really just a record of your understanding that you can refer to later. And when you refer to this later, you'll be able to remember your understanding. It's not understanding it a second time. It's just 
oh yeah, I already know how that works. So it's a lot easier when you're studying if you write notes in this way. Now, thirdly, this is one that I only picked up in this past year, but structure your notes to take advantage of how your brain works. So your brain is very good at remembering nested information and very bad at remembering flat information. So what do I mean by this? Well, usually your lectures are going to be taught in kind of chunks of concepts where there's a big concept and then a few littler concepts under that. And maybe each of those has even smaller concepts. The goal is to just write your notes in a way that nests these appropriately. It's very easy. I just like indent a little bit more for sub concepts. But what you get at the end is an understanding of how the material is structured. And then when you're remembering it, your brain has a lot easier of a time doing this because it understands the relationships. Taking notes like this will require a lot more focus in the moment. It'll be kind of uncomfortable at first but it will be tremendously beneficial when it comes to saving time and doing better later down the road. And this is a bit of a no-brainer, but you kind of just have to say it. Uh, make sure you keep your notes organized. I've lost notes a few times and it just sucks because like you knew that you have the material for that lecture somewhere, but you can't find it. It's just very frustrating. So have a binder, put your stuff in it. It's all you need to do. A lot of people are scared of asking questions because they feel that they'll be judged. They feel that they'll be, you know, asking a stupid question, but this is kind of ridiculous because like, think about the last time that you judged someone for asking a good question. Like never, right? Because the point is, if you're asking a question, probably it's on the teacher that they didn't explain a concept right or fully and other people in the class are gonna be confused too. So. If you're engaged in the material because you're distraction free, you're taking good notes and you still have a question, then ask that question to clarify your understanding. Because again, good students understand the material as it's being taught and then they don't need to relearn it again. So asking questions in the moment is going to save you from having to look stuff up later because concepts will build on each other. So if you don't understand something once, ask the question then before it's kind of muddled into everything else. Now I want to put a caveat in here. Don't be that student because we all have seen those students that just like ask questions to prove that they're listening or understanding. That's like no one wants to be that student. So, you know, don't limit yourself. If you're asking good questions and uh, it's actually because you don't understand the content, then great. But don't ask questions just for the sake of asking questions to prove that you're listening. Your teacher can tell if you're listening. You don't need to ask a question to prove it. A lot of teachers, especially in middle school and high school, get homework completely wrong. And this rubs off on students. So, for example, this usually happens in math, right? Where a teacher might assign 20 questions, all working on the same concept, just substituting in different numbers. This type of homework, in my opinion, is pointless. Now you have to understand, homework is tremendously valuable as a tool for building your understanding of concepts. Because I'm someone that learns by doing. I don't always understand, you know, methods of solving problems for math or science or anything like that until I do it myself. And then I have a pretty good understanding. So homework is tremendously valuable. But if you understood a concept when it was being taught and you've already tested yourself on it to a point where you feel comfortable that you could go into an exam and, you know, answer questions on it then why would you do more mindless repetition of the same types of questions when there are other questions which you're probably weaker at that you're neglecting? The point is that you have a limited capacity of energy and time to do homework in. And, you know, some teachers will not respect this and they will ask you to do mindless rote repetition. And I think that's ridiculous. Like it's actually atrocious when that happens, especially if they're grading it and checking it. But if they're not, then what you need to do is you need to just prioritize what are the problems which are most valuable to me. And the problems which will be the most valuable to you are the ones in which your understanding of the concepts are the weakest. Because you're gonna be tested on every concept. So don't do homework in order to make your stronger concepts strongest. Do homework in order to make your weakest concepts strong. And then if you have time and it's fun, then you can go through and you can do more problems and you can make sure you know everything's up to 100. But don't get things up to 100 before everything's up to an 80 or a 90. Now understand that this is not, you know, like a justification for not doing homework at all. Uh, this is a smart way of doing homework, not a lazy way of doing homework. It is understanding that you have a limited capacity of energy and time, so you might as well spend as much of that on your weakest concepts as possible and then go to the, the stronger concepts that you don't really need to practice as much. But you still need to practice. You still need to do homework. 
Now you've probably seen that triangle of pick two, uh, sleep, good grades, and friends. But I found that this is not actually 100% true. I know a lot of people who are able to pull off all three of these things, uh, myself included in that, through time management. Now there is no one time management system that works for everyone. It's kind of a personalized thing. Different things work for different people. But what I recommend doing is when school is pretty easy in the first few weeks of the year, just experiment around with different systems that you see other people, successful people doing, and see what works well for you. So I figure I'll explain my current system so that you can experiment with that if you want. So uh, what I do right now and what I've done since entering college is I'll put my classes and other recurring events like practices into Google Calendar. And then I'll also use Google Calendar to schedule appointments or things far in advance. Like if something's happening in a few weeks or a month or even in a week, I'll put things in Google Calendar. So then I use my growth book uh, in conjunction with Google Calendar. I will write out a plan for the day. I'll write out a schedule kind of going through from when I wake up to when I fall asleep. And I write out a to-do list and some goals and some motivation for the day uh, just to make sure that everything that I want to get done gets done. And that includes spending time with friends and relaxing. And it sounds kind of weird to talk about blocking off time to relax or to spend with friends, but I don't really think about it like that. I think about it more as limiting the time that I'm gonna be spending on work. So I put those things in my schedule to force myself to stop working, not to kind of create some discipline structure around everything. The point is that discipline is useful in getting what you need to get done so that you can do what you want to do. It's really about finding time, not about dividing your time. So that's the system that I use. Uh, but you know, there are plenty of systems out there that you can find just by researching, finding people you look up to, seeing how they plan their time. So I'd recommend experimenting, see what works with you. Just you know, figure it out for yourself because everyone's gonna be a little bit different. One interesting thing that I found is that most students don't spend time thinking about how they're gonna study for a test. They just kind of jump in and figure it out as they go. But I think it's actually a really worthwhile investment to figure out how to study more effectively because it's gonna save you a lot of time and it's gonna leave you much better prepared than just kind of winging it. So again, just like time management, there are a lot of different systems that work for different people. And again, I'm just gonna share what I do because I found it to be a pretty effective method. So my method for studying for tests relies on having taken notes throughout the year that I've been very engaged with. It relies on having a pretty good understanding of all the concepts and of having those concepts organized well. Because what I then do is when it comes time to study for a test, I'll gather all of my notes and all the course material, I'll go through and I'll create what's called a crib sheet or just a cheat sheet, which is essentially a summary of every major and minor concept in the course. I'll keep it very condensed, usually on one sheet of paper, sometimes two if it's you know a final exam for a big class. But what this does is it forces me to kind of recall my understanding of these things. And I won't always remember every concept because you're not gonna be fully engaged in every class, every time. Like sometimes you just are out of it. It's not a good day, it happens. But I'll go through and I'll create this cheat sheet. And then I'll go through all those concepts and I'll say, okay, which one is my weakest? And the way that I know which one of my weakest, I use uh, kind of like a variation of the Feynman method, which sounds complicated, but it really isn't. Uh, essentially, it's you look at the, the concept and you try and explain it to a hypothetical six-year-old or someone who is not familiar with the class. And if you can't explain it, then you go to your course materials and you relearn it until you feel confident enough that you could explain it. So once I feel confident enough that I could explain every concept in the course, I'm pretty much ready to go into the test. Um, and I'll do practice problems at this point just to you know, get ready to, for the types of problems that'll show up. Usually professors or teachers will give you some of these, otherwise you can find them on the internet. But I won't you know, work myself to death doing these. So I think this is a little bit of a differentiating factor between the way that I study for tests and the way that other people study for tests, in that once I have this cheat sheet and I feel confident in all the concepts, I will just stop. I don't really do, you know, excess practice problems. Just like in homework, I don't like doing, you know, problems that I already understand just to build confidence. I think that's a little pointless because it takes away from the final and the most important habit for successful students, in my opinion, and that is taking care of yourself. So I have thought for a very long time that student culture has been pretty messed up. There is a certain glory in suffering. Study for 12 hours, went to sleep last night at 3 a.m. and I woke up at six to study more. This doesn't really make sense to me. 
Fundamentally, I think you need to come to an understanding that humans are animals. You are an animal with animal needs. And in order for your animal brain to function at its highest capacity, at the highest level that it can, you need to take care of those animal needs, which is really pretty simple. So what does it mean? Well, it means getting a lot of sleep. If you're a teenager, you need nine hours of sleep. Most people won't get this, but if you can get eight to nine hours of sleep, you are going to be far more efficient at taking notes, at understanding things, and at taking tests. So sleep is like the biggest superpower that you can possibly give yourself as a student. Hydration is one that people just neglect. Just carry a water bottle around with you and drink a bunch of water, and you will, again, be far more efficient, far more productive. Nutrition goes along hand in hand with that. You know, if you're feeling like garbage, you are going to think like garbage. You are not going to do well. Along with this goes exercise. Again, you kind of have to just think about it like you are an animal that evolved running through, you know, planes, etc. I find, at least for myself, anecdotally speaking, and there are studies that support this as well, that when I exercise, I'm far sharper mentally. When I don't exercise, I get a little lethargic, I get a little lazy. And finally, you have to recognize that humans are social animals. So you can't actually just isolate yourself into a corner and study and you know exercise and eat and drink water and do everything right but have no friends and talk to nobody. You will be miserable. All of these things you can neglect in a short period of time. Uh, so you can get you know three hours of sleep one night and be you know mostly okay. Three hours is a, a little six hours of sleep one night or for a week and be mostly okay. But the point is to set yourself up for long-term success, not short-term success. So if you can build habits which keep you happy and satisfied as a person, as an animal, outside of school, then everything inside of school becomes infinitely easier. It is incredibly hard to succeed in school if your body's not there, if your mind is not there. You can't really just will yourself through these things. School is only so important. Your goal as a person should probably not just be to get straight A's. Your goal should probably be to be happy and fulfilled, right? Like what else do we really want? And school can be a path to these things. School can be made fun if you can set up these habits and you can figure out the system and figure out the game that you're playing. And you can treat it like a game. And that's really what I do. At the end of the day, tests are game days. Everything else is practice. It's all just figuring out how you can get to game day and show off what you can do. If you can figure out a mindset like that, then school becomes a source of fulfillment in your life, not a source of stress. So really my best advice is just to take care of yourself and to try and find enjoyment in the process of figuring out the game that is school, figuring out how to play that game most effectively so that really you're having fun and you're being fulfilled regardless of what the outcome is. And if you follow these habits and, and you learn how to play the game right, then the grades will follow. School can suck, but it can also be amazing if you do it right. So hopefully you picked up some tips from this video. Again, growth books on sale right now for the next week uh, on Amazon, link in the description if you wanna check it out. Uh, you can also always, of course, just copy the method that's in there and do it on paper if you wanna try it out. No one's stopping you. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed. Feel free to leave a comment, a like, a dislike if you want. Share on social media. I don't know. Thanks for watching. I'm John Fish. I'll see you next time.